Welcome everyone to our second open mic next in biotech series in this new and colorful meeting center at the main campus, also called MC3. We are really excited to see so many of you that found the way here. I think there's still more coming and that are interested in this, um, in today's event, uh, Emerging Trends in RNA and Gene Therapeutics. I am Franziska, Community Manager of the Switzerland Innovation Park, Basel. As an innovation park, our mission is to connect, support and engage people with ideas and passion in biotech, offering a platform for their growth. Now I hand over to my colleague Valentina, who is the ecosystem enabler of Basel Area Business and Innovation, the local business and innovation promotion agency. Vale. Thank you, Francisca. Uh, I'm very excited for the event that we put together, aren't you? And I want to thank you and I want to thank the organizing team. Great job. Uh, I'm really pleased to see also some new faces. Welcome to the Switzerland Innovation Park and some old friends too uh, from our ecosystem and beyond. And I think uh, you will agree with me when I say that this couldn't have been a better time to talk about RNA and gene therapeutics. Am I right? And of course, I'm referring to the recent Nobel Prize announcement in uh, physiology and medicine that finally recognized mRNA therapeutics uh, as one of the key technologies that changed the world. And I work in this field for a little while. And therefore, for me, this is not only an occasion to discuss about technological trends and advancements, but also to celebrate the efforts of those people, those companies, those scientists as well, that contributed to revolutionizing med medicine as we know it. Before proceeding though, I have to make an announcement. Unfortunately, one of our panelists cannot be here today and he's Peter Callis. Uh, the reason is that Peter unfortunately um, got COVID while coming to Basel and uh, uh, therefore is now stuck in London. So uh, he hopes that you will see the irony in that as, uh, as we all do. Uh, but don't worry, Peter is fine and uh, uh, luckily for us, uh, his co-founder of Nanovation Therapeutics, Dominic Bitzigman, decided to step in. So thank you very much, Dominic, for that. We are really pleased to have you on the panel. And so now, without further ado, let me introduce uh, our moderator, Margaret Schwarz. Margaret is the founder and CEO of Blackway Biosciences, one of our residents here at the Switzerland Innovation Park. Margaret has spent most of her career in the US, uh, first by building the cardiovascular research division at Amgen, and then as VP at CardioRenal at Böhringen Ingelheim, and finally also as global head of external innovation at Roche. Since 2018, Margaret uh, held various roles in startups, including CSO and uh, head of R&D in, uh, in Genevant, which is a lipid nanoparticle company based in Vancouver. Uh, she's also board director of Altamira Therapeutics, which is instead a Basel-based company that develops uh, um, delivery systems for extrahepatic uh, delivery to, uh, to extrahepatic tissues. And with this, I want to welcome Margaret on stage. Thank you very much. Thank you, Valentina, for the kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, my pleasure to be here today and uh, moderate this panel on such a timely topic as Valentina just mentioned. There couldn't be a better time for this discussion. And of course, we're not just here to discuss vaccines and the recent developments in that space, which have been rewarded with the Nobel Prize, but also much more generally discuss gene therapy, the oligonucleotide therapeutics, mRNA and siRNA therapeutics in general. Uh, because on all fronts, while there have been amazing developments over the last uh, years and in the decades since this field has started evolving, each of those fields also comes with very specific challenges. And um, that referred to not just the science, but also the manufacturing, the pricing, the regulatory environment, and uh, most of all, the delivery. Um, so we will try to touch a little bit on all of those aspects 
and have put together a very distinguished panel. Uh, and I'd like to start by introducing our panelists for today's uh, discussion. I'd like to start with Dr. Dominic Witzigman. He is the... Welcome, Dominic. Dominic is the CEO and co-founder of Nanovation Therapeutics based in Vancouver. He um, has started his academic career actually in, here at the University of Basel and has spent most of his career um, on RNA interference, delivery of DNA, uh, and RNA-based genome editing. Uh, he's done that not just here in Basel, but also at the University of Zurich, German Cancer Research uh, Institute, and at uh, UBC, University of British Columbia, which is where he met Peter Cullis and then founded Nanovation. And Nanovation is a platform company that develops next generation LNP technologies for extra hepatic delivery of oligotherapeutics. So, welcome, Dominic. Glad you could join us. Thanks a lot. Um, next in line, uh, Dr. Marie Leblanc. Welcome. Marie is the executive director of Global Head of Account Management, Cell and Gene Technologies at Lonza, here in Basel. Um, she has joined Lonza, a chemist by training, but she has joined Lonza in 2006 and has since then held various leadership roles, including uh, business development, sales, strategic marketing and commercial development across Lonza's portfolio of technologies, and that includes uh, small molecules, biologics, cell and gene therapeutics. Marie is also a board member of Basel Area Business Innovation. Welcome, Marie. Thank you, Margaret. Um, next, Dr. Hendrik Nutkan. <laughs> Welcome, Hendrik. Thank you. Hendrik is the global head of nucleic acid-based medicine and therapeutic modalities at the Roche Innovation Center here in Basel. He has um, started his career at IonGen, working on monoclonal antibodies against ion channels, then joined Roche in 2003, uh, first in Munich, Pensburg, where he built up the antibody engineering, humanization, and manufacturing cell line development division there for therapeutic proteins, then joined Roche uh, Basel in 2015, where he became program leader for uh, targeted therapeutics, and in 2019, became head of genomic medicines and targeted therapeutics. So we're glad to have you. Welcome, Henry. Thanks, Margaret. And last but not least, Dr. Cedric von Arburg. <laughs> Welcome, Cedric. Uh, Cedric is the director of Gene Therapy Research Europe, CSL Bering, based in Bern, Switzerland. Um, he has joined uh, uh, CSL in 2012, where he built up the preclinical innovation, innovation group at CSL in Bern. Um, he worked uh, on plasma-derived immunoglobulins uh, and delivery to the lung specifically, which is a big challenge. He later was responsible for building up the gene therapy research also in Bern. And today, he leads all European gene therapy research activities from candidate design to in vivo studies at CSL. Welcome, Cedric. Thank you. And with that, um, as you already heard, um, Professor Kallis unfortunately is not able to join us in person today, but he was kind enough to record a brief video, which we would like to play first to get us started with the discussion. Hello, I'm Peter Kallis, professor in the biochemistry department of the University of British Columbia, and I was supposed to be there in person today, uh, but uh, was prevented by catching COVID on, en route. Uh, when I arrived in London, wasn't feeling very good, and you know that was uh, that was the reason. Anyway, it has inhibited my travels, um, so I just, uh, thought I would put together a little video to um, introduce the session today. Uh, I hope it substitutes to some extent for uh, not being there. Uh, the, um, the story I'm telling is really one that is, I think, quite remarkable in that we're finally managing to introduce gene therapies to the population in a, uh, in a fundamental manner. And I just want the, the, the biggest, to, the biggest manifestation of that, of course, has been uh, the COVID-19 mRNA vaccines, which just received the Nobel Prize. And so I'm going to share my screen a little bit to show a couple of slides in that regard. 
this was the Nobel Prize, of course, was given to Katie Carrico uh, and Drew Weissman for the uh, COVID-19 vaccines, but in particular uh, for the modifications that they made to the messenger RNA, which really allowed it uh, to be non-immunogenic and have the potential for expressing proteins inside cells. But really, a major point here is that uh, these vaccines depend on a lipid nanoparticle to deliver the messenger RNA to the interior of target cells. My relation to all of this is that I began studying two basic properties of lipids in membranes about 50 years ago, uh, asking a couple of questions about you know, lipids, con membranes contain you know, hundreds of different species of lipids, and some of those lipids don't adopt what's normally assumed the major functional role of lipids to be a lipid bilayer that separates the outside from the inside of a cell. But some of those lipids are what's termed non bilayer lipids and what roles do they have and other lipids are asymmetrically distributed from one side to the other. So in other words, there's a different lipid composition on one side and the other. And so for really the most of the last 50 years, I've been very concerned with those sorts of studies. But in 2020, these studies resulted in the lipid nanoparticles that enable the COVID-19 mRNA vaccines. So what we did was we found a way of using lipids uh, to enable encapsulation of messenger RNA in the lipid nanoparticles and then we optimized their properties so they could actually enable intracellular delivery of the mRNA uh, into target cells. And so they made remarkably potent vaccines. But there are a number of steps in this. So the, I think the, the title says it all, 50 years of worrying about lipids has, uh, has led to some interesting results. So studying basic properties and, and, and <clears throat> starting in 1973, in the middle 80s, we started to work on trying to deliver anti-cancer drugs, as indicated over here, in lipid nanoparticles. And then uh, in uh, the middle 90s, uh, start having had some success with delivering cancer drugs, more specifically to where they're needed, said, OK, well, maybe we can deliver nucleic acid polymers. And so this work has gone on to this day. Now, this started with a story uh, I'm calling here the Ampatro story. And this was a, a drug where we were, deliver, we were developing lipid nanoparticles to deliver what's termed small interfering RNA uh, to inhibit production of a protein in the liver. And this was to treat transthyretin induced amyloidosis. Now, this was really quite, quite successful and resulted in a drug that was approved in 2018. It's a, it's a a condition that affects some 50,000 people. I thought this was what had been the high point of my career. But then in the in uh, in 2020, pulmonarity was approved by the by again the FDA, the EMA, and many other places, and really sprang out of our our program to see whether or not we could translate the efforts that we'd made for intron to deliver small interfering RNA to the liver to get gene expression in the liver. Now, this, this was work that was quite successful, done primarily in a company I co-founded called Acuitas. And one day we got called up by Drew Weissman, who was, uh, as we just mentioned, just won the Nobel Prize, saying, I really need a way to deliver my messenger RNA uh, to the interior, to, to immune cells in particular, following an IM injection. And so we sent him some material, and that worked extremely well. The, there's a vaccine for Zika virus and others and led us into the collaboration with BioNTech and Pfizer that resulted in the uh, Pfizer or BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine. So it's been an, am an amazing journey and one that, uh, you know, is not, it's not, certainly not one that one would normally have, have predicted from a basic start in, in looking at the properties of lipids in biological membranes. And so with that, I'll close. I think it's, uh, or at least I'll close with a couple of other remarks, and one of them being, we can express any protein we want now, in, at least in, in the liver and in the following injection intermittent muscularly. This is leading to treatments for a great many diseases. And very soon, we're going to be able to find uh, ways of getting to other tissues. And this will lead to probably drugs that will be able to treat most human conditions. So it's an extremely exciting prospect. Thank you very much. Indeed, um, as he said in his last sentence, the journey has been remarkable. 
The accomplishments are many. We wish Peter well and hope that uh, he can join us another time. And with that, uh, but he beautifully set the stage with this address, and with that we would like to dive right in. So all the accomplishments and exciting development that Peter just mentioned, I'd like to start with you, Dominic. How would you view the, some of the challenges and current state of, of the um, field? Yeah, um, and my perspective is really focused on non-viral on systems and like LMPs. And as Peter has mentioned, like we unlocked the liver in vaccines, but for infectious diseases. So to your question, challenge is definitely all around delivery. And it's about what is the route of administration? Like you can access extra part tissue by local administration to the eye or pulmonary to the lung. But then how do we access like the bone marrow or other tissues following intravenous administration? So what LMP to use? What is the payload? Do we want to silence, gene express, gene edit? And how long is the gene expression? Like mRNA is pretty transient. So there are other payloads like circular RNA, self-amplifying RNA, which could have extended expression levels. And the third point is um, the target tissue. Yeah, do we want to hit, for example, hematopoietic stem cells or immune cells following an intravenous administration? So what is needed is like, an, I would say, a customized lipid nanoparticle. So one learning and big challenge we face now is there's no one fits all. Like COVID hit the globe pretty yeah, unexpected to some extent, to some extent, yeah, expected. But the LMP is, is good, the mRNA is good, but as Peter shows, like there needs to be better vaccines and there needs to be better delivery systems to unlock other tissues. And would you say that when you enumerate all these different tissues that they're all created equally in terms of the challenges or are some that are easier to tackle than others in terms of delivery? I would say where I see the next is like local administration into certain tissues like pulmonary administration to the lung, eye or intrathecal administration to access the brain using lipid nanoparticles or following intravenous administration, definitely immune cells and blood cells. But there are other like more like hard to tackle tissues like kidney, Will definitely be a challenging one. Thank you, Dominic. Um, Hendrik, I know that one of your areas is targeted therapeutics. Would you like to comment? I think Dominic said it already. It isn't, it isn't one size fits all. But then when we look at the field, we look mostly at oligonucleotides, single stranded ASOs, um, siRNA, messenger RNA, and also DNA delivery with AV, adeno-associated virus capsets. I think there is progress in all areas, but it's very different. If you look in the oligo field, um, there is liver was always possible, there's on patro, it's a lipid formulation, but there's also a lot of conjugates coming up now, right? going outside liver, which is really, this is the tissue, I mean, this is the task we need to achieve. Right? Um, you have seen maybe for muscle, there are antibodies that target to muscle, like avidity, dine. Um, we at Roche, we look into, can we get them to the brain? So, you know, we have this brain shuttle technology that we use to have antibodies that can transcytose into the brain. And we, we try that also with oligonucleotides. Right? That is the next big thing for us. I think it needs to be a systemic administration that can reach, can reach the brain, basically. And for the DNA delivery, I think the best vehicle right now are the adeno-associate viruses. And you can also see there's a lot of engineering on the capsid ongoing. Right? And also there is a task, if you take the eye, do we get a capsid that after intervitreal in in injection can reach the outer retina? One task. The other thing is, again, if you inject systemically, can we get to the brain? And the, the progress we have seen from Voyager, Capsida, um, also Dino, which we work with, it is feasible. Right? You can find capsids with engineering that go to the brain. So I think very specific approaches, but it looks really promising in this area. That sounds exciting. And how would you, uh, in this, uh, obviously it's a large field, I'm guessing the competitive landscape is fairly crowded. Um, are there some approaches that stick out more than others? Um, yeah, so I mean, we, we focus mainly on like eye, um, brain and muscle, and we really look what is the, um, the most promising uh, approach to specific to these tissues. And um, I think it's, again, it's, I mean, it's, a, it's, of course, many different approaches are tested. But my, my view is we narrow down on certain things that seem to be successful. And um, it's not like, like that competitive that it is only one thing can make it for all. Right? It will be very differentiated. And uh, it's, it's a, still a long way to go. Right? It's nothing that will solve, be solved in, a, in one or two years. Well said, um, Cedric, from an immunology perspective, anything you would like to add? I think that's the future, going to yeah, targeted uh, delivery and, and targeting the right cells especially going to immune cells, for instance, knowing which cells to go after. Do you go for a treatment that can 
last for life? So if you touch the hematopoietic system cells, or would you go something which, where you touch only the progenitors, and you have something which just for 10 years, five years? I don't know, I think that would be very, it's very interesting. Um, yeah, so I think that's uh, exciting times with respect to extra hepatic delivery. Um, oftentimes we see very exciting approaches and then uh, the bio, when you look at the biodistribution in more detail, uh, it quickly emerges that we still have a lot of delivery to deliver and very little to extra hepatic tissue. So I think that challenge of shifting the biodistribution towards the target organ remains alive and well for now. Um, Another challenge is obviously the manufacturing of uh, these uh, payloads. And with that, I would like to ask Marie, from her perspective, um, what do you see as the major challenge in each of these specific areas or in the areas that you work on? Yeah, no, thank you, Margaret, for the, the question. I think, indeed, we do see challenges. <laughs> and there are numerous, I would say, but really um, the, the three mains we are trying to tackle as a CDMO and to uh, bring, I would say, our customers you know, what they need is to improve the quality of the processes. Um, this is one of the very important aspects we have. How do we uh, maintain sterility assurance? Uh, by uh, moving from open processes to closed processes. This is critical, right? You want to deliver to your patient a product uh, which is having the right quality attributes and manufactured you know, with the right specifications. It's the question of the reproducibility as well. How do we, you know, uh, from one patient to the next, especially into the uh, CAR-T and autologous cell therapy, uh, how do we maintain this reproducibility from one patient to the next and the robustness of the process, right? How do we also uh, make sure that we do have a, a process which is validated and then commercialized? So, I mean, at Lonza, but uh, also, you know, within other uh, specialized manufacturers, we, those are paths which we are really studying on how to maintain the quality of uh, of the processes and we do start working on those usually from already the development stages until we commercialize them through validation. We are taking very similar approaches to um, the other modalities which have been you know around for a longer time so but uh, in terms of the uh, quality assurance and quality control aspects those are the important things. I would say the second piece is really how do we Treat more patients, right? Because this is really also an important aspect of the manufacturing, the scale up and scale out. Um, you need to, in this space, what we are observing is that there is an accelerated timeline compared maybe to some other technologies or modalities. So how do we get to the patient fairly quickly um, and navigate through, uh, through, through those challenges? And the scale out, right, with um, having fresh material, starting from fresh material, for instance, of donors, how do we manage this and treat patients at the global scale? So we do have usually local manufacturing sites, uh, and we are trying also to bring what we call um, patient treatments or at point of care so that we can treat patients directly at the hospital. And the last one, which everybody would have probably in mind, is how do we uh, improve the cost of goods, right? Because this is, those are costly technologies in cell engine therapies. And if we want to treat a high number of patients going forward, uh, those are issues we need to, to tackle as well. So automation is certainly uh, one of the areas we are looking into. Um, as I would say an area of innovation. And then we are putting a big focus as well uh, with our customers on the analytics because there is, uh, this is becoming more and more the bottleneck. Um, so those are, I would say, really the three elements we are seeing as, uh, as, as challenges in the manufacturing space. Which is a lot. Thank you for the, yes. <laughs> thank you for the broad <laughs> overview. Uh, you brought up so many points, right, that I think we could have a sep many separate panels. But one of them is you mentioned cost of goods. And of course, yeah. that then translates into pricing challenges and then um, from there we need to discuss reimbursement and up uptake by the patient population and so forth. I know, Cedric, that's a subject you've been thinking about. Yes, exactly. So, for as you know, like producing viruses, you can do it transiently and using plasmids in a, in a cell line. Uh, obviously, you have to have GMP plasmids. Sometimes it can cost like hundreds of thousands of dollars just for a batch. So this is already kind of a starting cost, and you didn't even start to produce the viruses. So you have to have a 
quite a huge amount of, like, you know, we talk sometimes about 500 liters or more uh, of production of uh, um, production volume for the viruses. You have to make sure that your viruses are actually not empty particles, so you have actually a very good quality on your viruses. We also know that from our side, we work on the ex vivo gene therapy, so we take the cells of the patients, we have to uh, actually transduce them with the natural vectors, and hematoxysm cells actually, they, they don't like to be transduced, so you still have to work with some uh, small molecules to actually improve the transduction. It course comes to the cost because you have to license from someone else uh, who has maybe a good product, or to find yourself a product that would help the transduction. And uh, at the same time, you still need to make sure that the cells of the patients they are still doing their function, which is actually, you know, giving rise to all the hematopoietic uh, compartments. And so this is also very important to understand, the, you know, the quality and, uh, of your virus so that you can really target with the right uh, amount of integration in those uh, cells so that you don't uh, disturb their normal function. That is a very fair point. Uh, so th there is challenges then with respect to pricing of manufacturing for the payload but I think we can say similar things for the delivery from your perspective as the CEO of a company that develops these systems. Yeah, and, and maybe I can also refer to this person here, Marco Tufolini, our VP Chemistry, who, like, when we think about the LNP, and there are, like, four main components in the current COVID-19 vaccine. It's like DSPC, like a phosphatidylcholine. It's dirt cheap. Cholesterol a packed lipid to shield the LNP and a synthetic lipid, an ionizable cationic lipid. So we definitely focus on like, how can you make this synthetic lipid as cheap as possible with a, at least steps as possible. And so keep it simple is always our approach. And this is, I think, what, what yeah, defines Peter's success. Like make it simple because yeah, you can make the delivery vehicle very complicated with a lot of like layers and a lot of like targeting ligands. But the question is, can you yeah, approach it in a simple way? So like the least number of components to enable a therapy, I would say, is our approach. I imagine uh, that there is so much complexity to optimizing these particles, because even if you simplify as much as you can, you still have so many parameters that are moving targets, right, uh, to, to actually, especially when you're talking about targeted delivery to specific tissue, so, um, but... Um, 100%. Yeah, I think they're like in the field what we see there are two different approaches of the of developing lipid nanoparticles. One is the rational design. What we can we learn from biology? Are there certain receptors? Are there certain lipid interactions with certain receptors? Can we learn from the pharmacokinetics biodistribution of an LNP? And then the second approach is more with the upcoming AI and machine learning. Like can we screen through hundreds and thousands of different LNPs and like therefore learn more about how to design an LNP? I'm so glad you bring that up. You think the AI will be the solution to this? It will partially. I'm not at the moment, I would say. There are several companies popping out of the ground. I would say Peter's approach is, uh, has always been the rational design. How can you design a lipid or a lipid nanoparticle? Let's say on Petro, the first is RNA therapeutic works pretty well. It's based on like, yeah, endo, like mechanisms which our body knows of binding up OE and delivering to the liver. So... I think future will show if machine learning and AI can make a difference to that field. Do you think quantum computing can be of help, since we're talking about a massive <laughs> parallel optimization <laughs> problem here? Yeah, looking in the future quite a bit. But uh, I, I think it will contribute to the field, definitely, 100%. To which extent? I don't know. Our body is still pretty complex, I would say. Thank you, Dominic. Um, any further comments you have? I Marie, have a question maybe Marie? for you. Yeah. Um, in terms of delivery, I think one of the areas we are looking at um, and where we do have made some investment as well is exosomes and extracellular vesicles. What's your view on this? <laughs> we are strong. A very biased view. Um, I would say LNPs have shown that yeah, they can make a difference and they have been around for many, many years. And Peter did seminal contributions to the field. I was not even born. So mm -hmm. exosomes is a new field, but they also have to show like are they really better in terms of efficacy, safety profile, immunogenicity? I think all the delivery vehicles, LNPs, exosomes, conjugates, will find their niche. I think one delivery system is definitely not the solution for everything. So, yeah, I'm happy to see where exosomes where it go. Goes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. yeah, maybe a comment also on the gene therapies, because we know this is a high cost of good area. But also, if you look at the processes right now, 
um, this triple transfection in adherent or suspension cells, I think this is not um, a sustainable way to do it. And I mean, there's a large part of, of industry and, and biotech looking into this, how can you overcome this? If you compare this to antibodies, maybe 20, 25 years ago, it was the same. It was super expensive. And now if you look at cost of goods for antibodies, how much has this has dropped? So if the, if the clinical benefit will justify it, I think the investment will come to go and look at this. And you, you can look, there are approaches for stable cell lines, like, like for instance, for um, AAV production. And then you have no transfection, no DNA is involved in that. But that will reduce the cost of goods and you go back to a single clone producing, like for antibodies. What do you right. think is the bottleneck these days for uh, the cost of good reduction? Um, which right, component right now, this, is this, the most... Yeah. Yeah. So this process right now is a triple transfection. You need three DNA vectors, gene peak quality. Um, right, so lead, for each of them, you have an own individual process. Right? And then you have the transfection. Uh, it's not very robust. You just can't scale up maybe beyond 2,000 liters. 500 liters is pretty standard, I, I think. Maybe 2,000. If you compare this to a stable cell line, there would be, you need an induced expression because the web genes are toxic. You can't just make them all the time. Um, but if you have that, you can go to 10,000 liter, just induce no DNA, no transfection. A single clone, very robust process. You will learn a lot about quality in that respect. I think that is um, something that has to be tackled and has to be achieved. This is okay. something we are working, actually. We have a producer cell line for the yeah. lentural vectors and uh, we actually show very good titers and we can really, you know, freeze the cells for them and then we'll give you again the same titer again. So we have been very a lot of progress around this, trying also non-adherence. Uh, and I think there's clearly a way that we can get better vectors and sim make it easier to produce. It's also an area where we are super active <laughs> for lentivirus and also AAVs uh, with producer cell lines, but also platforms to uh, move from uh, adherent to suspension. Um, and we do look into how we can produce more with 3D bioreactors because we are, based on our expertise, more in, in mammalian technology and antibodies, um, a strong believer in that this is the path forward. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd like to just come back one more time briefly to the lipid nanoparticles as delivery vehicles, uh, Dominic. Do you think there are certain limitations that cannot be overcome in terms of not just the manufacturing, but the, if you talk about targeted delivery to certain tissues? I know tissues are not created equal, but would you think there is a situation where other systems are needed beyond LNPs? Let's say there's always the magic bullet following like intravenous administration going into the brain. At the moment, this is for LNPs pretty challenging, I would say. Um, this is definitely a big challenge or like tissues like kidney. So there are certain tissues which are not easily accessible. I think it will cost time and money to, to really unlock these. There's like, you asked about targeted delivery, but uh, there's one point I was writing down which we didn't really touch base on. It's like the challenge around IP. Like what we see with the success of COVID-19, there has been a lot of litigation ongoing now because of the success. And so finding the niche not only on the delivery part and like accessing tissues, but also on the IP part will be one of the key steps forward. That's probably another topic where we could have a whole panel, yes. right? Given the <laughs> <laughs> recent developments in that field. But thank you for yeah. bringing that up. Yeah. And uh, a related topic, um, there are there have been a lot of developments in the field, one of which is that uh, due to COVID and uh, progress that we've seen in the vaccines and the mRNAs, um, the regulatory landscape starts to change. And um, that's a topic that we would like to at least bring. It's another big topic, but we would like to bring it up at least briefly. Where do you see uh, the regulatory landscape going? Dominic, back to you. So where I really hope our field goes and the regulatories on when we look at LNPs and the current studies on genome editing, where you combine the same LNP with the same mRNA encoding for an editor and a guide RNA, which could be personalized, is the regulatory framework around how can you use the same delivery vehicle and actually more or less the same nucleic acids to cure, not, in, not only treat, but really cure patients and different patients with different disease, or same disease type, but different mutations. And do you see movement from the agency on this topic? Slightly, yeah. I would say, talking to various other like co-founders and from bigger pharma, like the agencies are relatively slow and they need to adapt to the, the massive scale and the massive speed of this field. Yeah. So there needs to be a change. The question is when. Would you say COVID has been an accelerator that was needed? 100%. Like 
accelerator that people get aware of. Now everyone knows what RNA is and have heard of RNA. And also for the field, for sure. There's a lot of like, obviously, the market is tougher than it was like during COVID, but a lot of money has gone into that space. Yeah, 100%. Without COVID, we wouldn't be at this stage. So some benefit, belatedly, from all the suffering worldwide. Um, the topic of what comes next is obviously another big one. Um, what do we do? Where do we go from here? Um, we've made enormous progress as a field uh, with oligotherapeutics. They have managed to solve a big problem in the setting of an infectious disease. But we have rare disease and we have complex disease. And do we think that in the setting of rare disease and complex disease, um, we will see a breakthrough anytime soon? Who wants to comment? A breakthrough in which direction? In the direction in the, in a breakthrough, the... will we see a breakthrough when it comes to rare genetic disease and um, with respect to mRNA delivery? And, uh. Yeah, because it has its own set of challenges which are quite different from a vaccine. Maybe I can touch base on this. Like they're Intelia, they're doing studies with LNP mRNA systems for genome editing of the same disease on Petro was developed for, like um, transthyretin induced amyloidosis. And they have shown in a clinical study, I think it was last year in the UK, that they can cure five individuals with one shot. And yeah, tackling the same disease and bringing down and knocking out the transthyretin. Uh, so, yeah, for rare diseases, it's huge potentials. The question is then also on the ethical side, like, yeah, obviously you can cure a patient, you can shut a certain thing down, but then you, it's more difficult to get it, uh, like, up again. That's the shutting down side. What about the overexpression or restoring expression levels in a loss of function situation? Different challenge. Yeah, uh, and genome edit editing can, like, when we look at, like, certain studies, even so there it's not overexpression from birth therapeutics and targeting like PCSK9 and knocking that out. You can also do gene expression using mRNA, but then it's transient. And Moderna is currently doing certain studies where they have to reinfuse every two weeks into patients. So it's a solution. You can like use the liver as a bioreactor. And as Peter was saying, like the liver is the bioreactor in our body. You can produce any protein you want and secrete it into the circulation. The question is, yeah, how often do you have to do this uh, infusion? And can you do on the payload side what I said at the beginning, like LMP can solve one part of the problem, but then the payload, for example, can circular RNA be more long-term or like self-amplifying RNA? Circular RNA, another big topic. <laughs> can circular RNA help solve uh, targeted therapeutics? I think there was a lot of excitement about circular RNA. Um, my impression is it cooled down a bit because the, I mean, the, the half-life maybe isn't so much longer than on linear. So you still have um, endonucleases cleaving. It. So just saying it's circular, it hasn't a five prime, three prime end. Um, what, what, what I see is in the literature, what, on data we, we and others have, is that it extends maybe two, three-fold the half-life. So it's not like massive. Um, Though, and the delivery challenge remains. Right? So outside liver, how do you want to deliver that? Because it will need a lipid nanoparticle. And then it needs to be a targeted one, right? so which is still quite a challenge. So I think there is um, promise on circular A, but it's maybe not the huge breakthrough. Do I understand you correctly? You're saying that um, the half-life is, is longer, but not sufficiently long to translate into massively elevated protein expression, which is what yeah. you would need to actually make the difference. Yeah. I mean, you have, you have um, circular RNA in, in red blood cells, which lasts there for a very, very long time, but it's a very specific cell type. In other cell types, it's, it's usually much shorter. Right? And then, I mean, two-fold, three-fold is something, right? It's not, it's not nothing. But then you have to compare also what, is, what can a gene therapy offer? Right? And if it's like a non-proliferating cell where an, an AAV virus can work, this could be even much better. It could be a one-time treatment then or at least for many, many years, as we know from, by now. How about uh, coming back to the topic of gene therapy for a second? How about the one-and-done approaches? You mentioned verve therapeutics really briefly, but there are others, right? Uh, the one-and-done gene therapy to solve a complex disease. Is that the future? This is the new, Cedric. Yeah, <laughs> I think this is where people are going. We have all built our knowledge and expertise from monogenic diseases. 
because it was clear you know the gene is defective, so we changed that. Either now with editing, you can uh, replace the gene or even uh, correct uh, the mutations. But I still think that the future will be when we go into bigger indications, when we understand actually the biology better. I think that we do a lot of omics. You know, we talk always about personalized medicine, so we are screening a lot of uh, patients, and you know, we look into their tissue, trying to understand how can we actually put them into groups so that they can respond to a certain drugs better. And when we do that, I guess we can actually, you know, we have a homogeneous group, I would say. And then if you can pinpoint and understand what is the, the best target there, then you can go for gene therapy, potentially, or any RNA therapeutics. Thank you, Cedric. So a lot of complexity, and I think we've touched on a lot of different topics, each of which we could expand probably forever. Um, our first section of the panel is coming to an end soon, and then we open up the, the, um, to, to questions from the audience. And we have more time for that, not just here, but also over a glass of wine later on. But before we transition, I would like to ask each of you, where do you see the field going in the next, let's say, decade? What is going to be the big thing that will happen, Dominic, starting with you? Yeah, and, and maybe I can also re reflect a bit on, on Peter's perspective, because Peter and I discuss a lot where we th see the next big thing. And I think there are two things where we uh, commonly like focus on. One is like personalized cancer vaccines. We do so much omics, so how can we really leverage the knowledge we create there and the data and like, yeah, personalize these therapies? Like, can we produce the cancer vaccine in the hospital? Or is it decentralized at certain points within one country? And then it comes into the hospital. And the second part where like uh, Peter's focus is on since several decades is triggered, triggered therapies. Like can we actually leverage RNA therapeutics or LMPs to, to do kind of a global transfection but have an on and off switch whenever we want to like induce a certain gene expression. So can we actually use either external stimuli or certain stimuli encoded on, on the nucleic acid to switch an on and off. So personalized therapies with on off switches. That would be the best combination if you combine the two answers, yeah. Excellent. Marie? Well, I, I would relate to uh, what Dominique has just said because I think the future will be really around, you know, personalized therapies and personalized treatment. How can we, on the manufacturing side, you know, enable that um, to ensure, you know, we can treat patients where they are um, and we are developing a number of equipments and systems to enable that. Uh, but it's a long way because we, there is the reg regulatory framework as well, our environment we need to uh, take care of. Um, and, and so it's really, it's going to be around automation and how ensuring as well how the personnel of the hospitals or the point of care are able to, you know, process the cells and uh, reinfuse them to, pat to patients in a safety manner. Um, so we have developed a, a, a platform uh, which is called Cocoon, and you, you may have heard about that. I mean, you can look at it. It's a closed system uh, which enables you to treat, basically, and re-engineer the cells. Um, but there, there are still some improvements which need to be done, but it's already used in the, um, phase one and phase two clinical trials across uh, different parts of the world. And we are hoping, you know, it's going to be able to be scaled up. We are talking about, in the future, manufacturing several of those, um, you know, re-engineering cells of several patients at the same time at one point of care or in the hospitals directly. So that would be a tremendous, I would say, innovation and uh, uh, a big hope for patients. Thank you, Marie. Nick. I think we will see very specific solutions for um, the different modalities. So like for the oligonucleotides, I, I think there will be conjugates that can target specific tissues. There will be also maybe a certain, um, maybe even devices that you will use to deliver them. For, for the mRNA, I see the, the lipid nanoparticles, are, maybe or particles are the way to go. They will be more targeted. You will not reach all the tissues, like the brain maybe you won't reach, but others you can. Um, maybe even the distribution in the brain gets better, right? that would also be in, uh, we can address. And, and the big field is also the uh, cell gene therapy. Right? Just if you look into all the capsid engineering that has happened recently, I mean, for the, for the main vehicle here, the AAV, it's a protein capsule. You can do protein design. I mean, this is maybe one of the things we can design best, proteins like antibodies, or the proteins that have been designed. There's, there's still a lot that these um, capsids can do. Right? And then, I mean, even if you look at these serotypes, I mean, there are serotypes which have just 15% 
sequence in common. So they're very different. That's why they're called serotypes. Right? The antibodies don't cross-react between them. So the field is huge. Right? And this virus seems to be it's one of the safest ones to deliver the DNA, basically, to cells. We can tackle tissues with them, which, um, which we can't do right now just by protein engineering. So I think this will also be a field. I think they will progress in the next couple of years. And when you say, just for clarification, modality-specific solutions, yeah. can you say what do you mean by that in terms yeah. of breakthrough? Yeah, so the, like, uh, maybe for the oligos, it's more the conjugate. Maybe for the, for the mRNA, it's more the lipid nanoparticle. And maybe for the gene therapy, it's capsid engineering, protein engineering. Right? So very different approaches, but they're all... Um, and the progress we see would tell us this is the, the way to go, one way to go. Right? Thank you, Hendrik. And you have the last word, Cedric. Where are we going in the next decade? So actually, um, I would have liked to talk again about personalized medicine, but I want to actually take another angle now and say that in 10 years from now, we will see a lot of CAR Ts everywhere, not and beyond oncology. So I believe that you know now we go even beyond T cells, we go for NK cells, we are talking about uh, off-the-shelf uh, NK cells. I believe that there's a way to trick the cell, the immune cells, to actually go after certain diseases. And CAR Ts are actually going now in SLE, recently it was published. So I think that the future is around this. Potentially beyond CAR Ts is about, you know, someone said about biofactories. Mm -hmm. You know, do we still need to produce monoclonal antibodies in the way we are producing them right now? Maybe not. Like, you know, we are always talking, oh, is the, this recombinant protein uh, having the right glycosylation to be functional? Maybe actually we just give it to the right cells to be done in, the, in vivo mm -hmm. in the patient. That's a wide range of predictions. I hope we, in five years, we can have a, in 10 years, we can have another panel to see which ones <laughs> came true. And with that, I would like to thank our panelists for the first part of this. Thank you very much. Big round of applause. And then open it up to questions from the audience. There's a, it right in front of you? Yeah. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to take it home. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, a few things that I hear is that uh, many challenges are related to monogenic diseases or to new approaches that they are beyond the vaccines. I think all are really excellent topics for these new modalities. What I see is that often we will need to deliver the dose more than once. It's not always the one and done, even in monogenic diseases. So if we are talking, for instance, for liver, where maybe in infants and it grows very fast, you will need to do, give more than one dose. And this means there will be a big problem of immunogenicity. So my question to all of you is, what are you doing to mitigate these problems that uh, they are already here? We know with the COVID vaccines, they are excellent to induce immune responses but the therapeutics will do the same. So what are you doing to mitigate these uh, issues that uh, we will be facing already now? Thank you for the question. Who wants to? I can, I can say, yeah. I think you're right. I mean, if you look into the um, hemophilia field, you look into uh, AAV-traded patients and you look at the level of factor eight or nine they express, it's declining over time, but we have now data like more than 10 years in some patients. So, it's still above the therapeutic level, but of course, as the, as the liver proliferates, it will lose the virus. You can't treat very early. Right? If the liver is still growing, that wouldn't be the right treatment. Can you use then an mRNA approach in the, in the first years, right? After a certain age, maybe you can come with an, with an AV as a second shot on goal. Um, to extend that, that would be one. The, if you say you need multiple AV gene therapies, um, we are not there yet. Yeah, you can. If that's the first, if you ask for the, is the transgene immunogenic? The question was, can also be just the mRNA, what is encodes be immunogenic? And it can be, right? You can see also in the, in the trials, if you, if you design a trial, you have to make sure that for the patient, it's not a foreign protein. If it is a foreign protein, it will be very difficult. Right? So if, it's a, if the patient has um, the, the gene, produces a protein, but it has, for instance, a point mutation, and it's still there, the protein, so he's kind of trained, he's used to it. He's, um, then you may come with a version that only has a few mutations. It is a healthy copy of the gene. If there's a complete deletion of the gene, and you have seen this also in Duchenne trials, um, you, you, it's very difficult then maybe to, to recruit patients for that. That's true. 
And there's, not, there's, n there's nothing, nothing maybe easy to tolerate that. I don't. There are ways people tolerate it. Yeah. It's magic world. Yeah. I don't, it's difficult. Yeah. Go first. Additional comment, yeah? Please I think first. it goes to, uh, maybe you wanted to mention the Intelia work, but I think they are working on the liver. I think um, now there are more than 200 uh, patients having gene editing, you know, uh, done in their cells. The question would be, you know, like, if it's safe, can we go and move from adults to children? And is it, if it's safe, then I think it's a solution to, to have a one treatment for life by editing the liver cells. And then one more comment, and maybe doing a one step back and then talking about the future and solutions. When we look at Ompetro, the first ever uh, as iron therapeutic, is an LNP approved in 2018, patient get infused every three weeks. <laughs> there are no side effects. Obviously, like they are pre-medicated heavily with uh, histamine blockers, dexamethasone, and acetaminophen, but yeah, every three weeks they get the infusion. So the LNP is one side, you mentioned mRNA. So like for certain therapies, yes, we need like to diminish certain immunogenicity of the LNP. COVID vaccines were defined or developed to be immunogenic and like induce the immune system and the mRNA modifications. And this really why, where some of the payload will make a huge difference. So for example, in our uh, development, we have seen huge differences between different payloads. We work from like small RNAs to large RNAs to DNA vectors. You can use the same LNP for different vectors and you see a different immunogenicity profile. So the payload plays a very important role. Thank you. Um, there's a question right there, and if I can ask you to please briefly introduce yourself before you ask your question. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Matthias Flemmer. I'm a principal scientist from Vector Biopharma. It's a company, a uh, delivery company actually here based in Basel. Uh, my question is, um, from the recent data that circulated on LinkedIn and, and elsewhere, if you look at the, all the clinical trials currently ongoing, the gene therapy trials account for lower single digit percentage let's say and then if you look at the trials that are actually being terminated or, or abandoned uh, this this is uh, in higher double digit numbers so i'm wondering what, what is your perspective uh, there is it's obviously linked to the to the complexity of the of the systems as, as, as has been discussed the delivery system and the payload and, and all that but do you think there is a prospect of of reducing the 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 risk let's say of of uh, these therapies before they enter the clinical trials, because it's obviously also linked to a, a very high costs, right, and, and, and everything. Do, do you think that this is just a matter of, of uh, all these technologies being very new and, and not having enough experience with this and over time, uh, you know, with LNPs, for example, and so having this uh, more under control, or you think this is an inevitable thing that will always be a problem? Thank you. So risk profile. You want to start on the viral part? <laughs> I, I can start on the viral part. Um, so there is, um, also the, the AVs have been discovered uh, more than 50 years ago. There's still, and you look in the, in the process how they are made, and, the, and the, the key process parameters that we understand, or the field understands, it's still very early. It is not comparable to, um, to other drugs. It's very complex. I mean, it's a, it's a virus particle with DNA. Um, and I think there will be a, a huge improvements on the, on the quality assessment. You see trials where you have efficacy, and you see others where you don't, and you, you can ask why. And I think the field is not there yet to have this developed to the same standard as other drugs. On the other hand, there is also a high medical need. We, have, we know we have diseases where, where patients can't wait. So what, what, should you, what do you do? You can, for some of them, you can't wait. So you will try um, um, to do this, and that especially also, also in, in the biotech field. Right? You, you think you have a drug, and you, will, you want to develop this for the patient benefit, this is the first thing. But it's always, it's always a risk-benefit question. That's also why the first approaches were mostly in, in really um, deadly diseases. Right? And, and when you have seen also um, transformational changes in, in some of the, even of the six approved gene therapies, if you look at the benefit, if we do everything right, it can have a huge impact on the patient. But I think there is further development needed. So it's an indication-specific risk profile, you're saying, that needs to be taken into it's account? It's also a technical risk still, I think. Yeah, if I would add my perspective, also seeing a, a, a big portfolio of companies, right, working with diverse uh, customers, the, the challenge from my perspective is not necessarily on the outcome of the clinical studies, on the efficacy, but we see a lot of challenges com our customers are facing from an economic perspective. Um, the 
current world is not very, uh, um, I would say, you know, um, positive to find to raise funds at the moment, right? So it's 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 challenging as well for companies to go beyond and continue their clinical trials. Um, and it's it's creating, I, I would say, there has been this hype, right? I mean, during the COVID time, where there were a lot of funding was invested into the biotech community and as well into those innovative technologies. But uh, there was probably maybe a misunderstanding from the investors what it would take from a you know economic perspective to bring those therapies to the market. Uh, and then I think at the same time, we are navigating as well through some regulatory challenges. We can see some of the approvals being delayed, right? Because the regulatory agencies are asking for more data, um, sometimes on the clinical trials or a comparability study because something has changed. And so this is also, you know, creating additional delays. And unfortunately, there are a couple of companies who are um, yeah, either filing for bankruptcy or closing their um, <laughs> operations. And maybe one last comment, like regarding the LNPs, when we look to the safety profile and the efficacy of the approved LNP nucleic acid drugs, like on Petro and the COVID-19 vaccines, what Peter always highlights in the preclinical models, especially rodents, we should achieve a therapeutics index of more than a thousand to really make this a translatable. And I would say this approach, at least for what is approved, holds true. Like when on Petro came out, the the efficacy of the of the of the clinical study for the neural impairment score. What Peter always likes to say is like one over Avogadro's number, like such a significance is big. And the efficacy for the COVID-19 vaccines in, in the initial studies was 95%. So there, then the safety needs to be assessed very carefully, obviously. But I think, yeah, the preclinical studies are key in that aspect. Thank you. Well, quite, there's a question right there. And another one in the back and another one here. We go here first, and then there's two more in this section. Okay. Thank you. Hello, my name is Kualanga Panera. I'm Chief Operating Officer at Altamira Therapeutics. And I have actually two questions, if I may. <laughs> so the first one is, um, I agree with you, LNPs are very good. They do many things, especially for vaccines. But when we think of chronic diseases, and maybe not so severe diseases, immunogenicity is still a challenge. So there are other materials, there are peptides, there are, there's polymers. What are your thoughts on these types of materials that, of course, are out there and that can potentially be a solution for other tissues and especially chronic, non-severe diseases? And then my second question is related to, to manufacturing. We've uh, touched upon rare diseases and the challenges for personalized, but also taking that to the other extreme, uh, especially oligos are getting into mainstream diseases and chronic diseases, and that is a big challenge to produce as much, you know, payloads as we need. So how are we solving that, especially when this is not only for one disease, but for many diseases? Yeah. Thank you. So first part is the non-LNP delivery systems. Maybe I can start. And I would say for any non-LNP delivery system, it will be obviously more a challenge because like there have been not only the COVID-19 vaccine known on Petro proof, but several like lipid-based nanomedicines before for in the anti-cancer, anti-fungal um, arena. So it will be more challenging. And then the question is, okay, what is it? Is it a combination of a peptide with an LNP? Is it a, a hybrid polymer lipid system? Lipids are, let's say if we take the current compositions, are, lipids are very well defined versus a polymer could have a much larger like polydiversity. So I think they will find their niche to get them into the clinic and across the finish line will be much more challenging since there has been a lot of learnings in the LMP field. Obviously, very biased answer. <laughs> <laughs> I can take the partially, I believe, the piece on the oligonucleotide manufacturing challenges. I, I think they are probably as well, right, the need for uh, companies to look into that, right? And... As long as I remember, we were super active in the field of oligos, but like 15 or 20 years ago, and we exited because that was probably too early. But now that there is indeed a, a focus again on those technologies, I guess more industrial companies, you know, 
will look into those fields and apply some of maybe you know the knowledge and expertise they do have uh, into improving manufacturing processes, bringing the cost of goods down, enabling the scale up. I think one of the challenges we have in the field of oligos is really access to raw materials, um, which is a, a, a big challenge. And, and really, how do we address that as there is more and more uh, clinical programs um, around the world? Yeah. Thank you. Um, there were two questions. Yeah. And I know there is one more right where you are. Yeah, exactly. And one more. Hello, my name is Laurent Stark, project manager in Thermo Fisher. And I wonder, you five are working at companies, but do you work with academia? And do you work a lot with, the, with them? Do you read the papers? Happy to start. Um, <laughs> yeah, so like we have, I would say, two schemes. One is strategic partnerships where we work with small, large biotech, pharma. Um, and obviously this data you mostly won't see. But then we have like something which we call scientific excellence network, where we work with several different academics on various different issues to really see the, the potential of different and new LNP systems. So yes, we are pretty open to that and also like the dissemination and publication of all that data. Yeah, very similarly for us as well, we do work with academias as well in the, in the really science field and the, on some specific technologies. The same for us. We, uh, we have therapeutic areas where we focus, and then we are going to look after academic lab where they have all the expertise, because often, you know, innovation is also coming from those labs, so we can't do everything. I hope we didn't make the impression that we don't read the papers. <laughs> um, no, I think the, most of the, in, even in, in a big company like Roche, most of the innovation comes from, from external. I mean, we, we are more like um, looking into this, um, doing confirmational studies to confirm data, which is also a challenge. I mean, you can tell a lot of things are published and very hard to reproduce. I think that's, a, that's what we always see, right? So we look a lot into this, we read a lot, and we try also to confirm internally, and then um, we would also go into collaborations. Yeah. It's more biotech, academia is not always so straightforward, but we look at this heavily. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Uh, the gentleman in the back, yep. <laughs> Olivier Morant, Teralto for rare metabolic diseases. Uh, I'd like to touch upon the question of uh, gene engraftment in, in gene therapy. I don't think the panel has discussed that. And um, recently I was reading about uh, a gene therapy clinical program in Fabry disease, which has been abandoned because of high variability in gene engraftment. So my question to the panel is, are they better technologies to deal with that? Is this really a common issue or a rare issue? Thank you for that question. Is there someone? I can, I can, oh, I can start. Um, you mean like a targeted integration into the genome of patient cells like with CRISPR or other technologies? Um, I think the, if you do CRISPR-Cas engineering and you cut a gene in the liver, that is something that is feasible. Uh, high efficiency rate, one-time treatment, um, mRNA delivery, that's all pretty straightforward. If you want to integrate, you also have to provide DNA. Providing DNA to a, to a cell is, is, is very different to providing RNA. It's a lot more toxic, it's a lot more immun innate, um, innate immun immunogenicity that you trigger. Um, and I think the tools we have right now are maybe not, not specific enough. Right? There's also a lot in the literature. Once you engineer cells, even if you have non-cutting um, cuts, Variants, right? You still get um, double strand breaks, uh, and this is usually auto these cells may have a growth disadvantage. So um, I think the field is not there yet that you can precisely engineer the genome and really define where you integrate and how you integrate into the genome. In the in the long run, that is maybe the, the way to go. Right? And to not just provide an episomal DNA in some of the cells and you lose when the cells proliferate, as you really integrate. Um, but I would say right now, our understanding of the technologies are not sufficient yet to do this. Right? Even if you look into some transposons, there is data, some of the transposons really, really trigger uh, insertional mutagenesis right? with, with a really bad outcome. So it's, I think it's pretty early for this. And um, I think there will be advancement, right? It is the way to go. That should be the future. Yeah, maybe also for like the 10 years future is, <laughs> can we integrate, a, a design any kind of DNA and integrate into the position in the genome where we want this to have. And I think we can't do this right now. 
Cedric, and, if, and I think yeah, you mentioned dosing, and I think gene editing is elegant in the sense that you can get one or two copies, <laughs> not more. Um, when we talk about viral vectors, then you know AAVs, you still have a lot of that would go in a cell. Not all will be you know giving rise to the protein, but you know you will still have a lot. Uh, when you think about integration, I'm thinking about natural vectors, obviously, and and I will, it will always come back to the quality of your vectors. If you have some batch variation, if you will have a lot of empty particles or like particles with a, like a genome which is not um, with the right size, or you know there will be internal splicing, this creates obviously that you have integration but you don't get the expression of your gene of interest. And so this is important when we are actually creating those you know um, particles to have some like a very good quality um, control over the, that so that we can really understand that what is the right dosing in those patients. Thank you, Cedric. Uh, there was a question right there, the lady in white. Yes. Oh, thank you. Um, so, hi, my name is Ming Wang. I'm from Gene Data Software Company here in Basel. Um, so, my question is uh, related to predictive drug discovery, um, as in predictive models to help you uh, in early drug discovery. Uh, we touched upon it when we had. We, we quickly discussed uh, AI and ML. Um, obviously, it would be really helpful if we had these models that could uh, give you a, a starting point when you do your hit, dis hit, uh, your hit identification. However, to get there, we need huge amounts of data. Um, so if we think about other modalities, for example, in antibodies, I know of pharma companies that have this initiative. They are just producing huge libraries they're screening, they're screening them um, with the aim not just to get to uh, good assets for their pipeline, but the data itself is an asset for them. Uh, so I was wondering in the RNA gene therapy, cell therapy field, are there similar initiatives to create these huge databases with the aim to um, make predictive models out of them? Thank you for that question. Maybe I can take the first one. Um, your, the simple answer is yes. So on the RNA side, for example, it's clear that the structure of the mRNA has a significant impact on stability of the mRNA, for example, and translatability. So there are like now companies in the US using AI machine learning to predict the structure and therefore do a sequence optimization to have a, a much more stable mRNA. And on the LMP side, yes, there are also like companies working on AI and machine learning to develop new types of LMPs, but what they often don't consider is safety, learnings from the past, and also um, IP uh, landscape. Because, yeah, just coming up with a new ionizable lipid doesn't mean that you have freedom to operate and you can push this forward. Anything to add? I think you, I think you, you almost said it, right? You need a huge amount of data right, to, to have coming as a training set. And I, for several approaches, because they're still early, I don't see them. As you said, you see this for antibody structure. Can we get to a, a stage that we can, if we have a target, that we can design just in silico the antibody part? I think that is maybe something we, we, we will get to. Um, but there's, there's maybe 20, 25 years more experience in that field. with many, many structures solved. Uh, I don't think that we are there in general for the entire field. There are specific applications, so where you have a high throughput data or you have bulk data, like barcoded libraries, right, where you can engineer, and then you have a lot of data. I think for these um, areas, you, you may apply machine learning, but for several questions, I think, in the field, there's just too little data for that. Do you think it's a question of computing power? No, it's more that you don't have the experimental data to train you, and then you get the computing. Mm -hmm. We have time for one more, and then we will have to defer the rest to the wine. <laughs> Thank you so much. So last question, challenging one. I'm Cristina Bruno from the World Health Organization. So we are doing quite some efforts to bring these innovative technologies to low and middle income countries as well. Um, I was just wondering if in your settings, when you start new development, new programs, looking at new processes, new technologies, you have the global market also in mind learning especially from COVID, where we have seen the stability of the vaccine being one of the main challenges. I will not comment on the COGS because we all know about it, 
but just curious to know if you have any program to simplify the, the production, the composition, to enable access easier for also low resource settings. Thanks. Very timely question. Thank you for that. I can take it on the LNP mRNA vaccine front. So we have certain discussions with various different, let's say, foundations. Um, the approach is what I said before, keep it simple. Like, how can we simplify the LNP? Cost of goods is how can we synthesize uh, effective or efficient ionizable lipids, which are really cheap and cheaper and much simpler to synthesize compared to what we currently have. And then, uh, yeah, we definitely look significantly into storage. And I would say storage stability is a big topic for various other LMP companies, like either improving, um, let's say, freezing, but this might not solve the certain challenges for low middle income countries, but then looking to lyophilization or spray drying of lipid nanoparticle mRNA systems to have a long term storage stability. So, answer is yes, we definitely work on that. Yeah, I would say we are. It's also a, a topic we are looking into from the perspective of, you know, bringing the manufacturing closer to the patients to indeed sol solve some of the challenges with regards to storage, uh, transportation of uh, tissue or uh, donor cells, and how we can enable that uh, in the future. All right. Well, thank you for that. Um, I think we've come to the end of the... Uh, session here. I would like to thank the panel for everything you've contributed and for the great discussion. I would like to thank the audience for your attention and for your questions. Um, we defer the rest to the um, next part of the event, right? And with that, a big round of applause for the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much. And back to Francisca. Do I have the right mic? Yes, I do. So I think you're all ready for a drink or something to eat or continuing discussions or everything together. That's why I will make this short. Thank you, Margaret, for, this, um, for moderating this great um, panel discussion. Um, I think there's still some open questions which you can continue out in the foyer uh, during the APORO. Thank you um, for this lively, engaging, interesting uh, exchange and discussion, Marie, Dominic, Hendrik, and Cedric. Thanks for coming. Um, a big thanks also to Valentina, where is she? There she is, <laughs> for co organizing this event together with our colleagues from marketing and the event management. Thank you so much. Another thanks goes to Sen, um, who's the main campus developer and our supporting partner. And last but not least, a big thank you, Margaret said it already. To all of you for coming here tonight or this evening um, to take part in this really great event. Um, if you're interested in our upcoming events, please register to our newsletter. And I think now we're ready. Um, there's a nice APRO for you outside. Please um, help yourself and dive into more discussions and enjoy this, the rest of this evening. Thank you. Thanks.